Hey everyone, Casey Quorum here, producer of the podcast. We have officially wrapped season three here at The Ferment. For the next few weeks, we'll be reposting some of our favorite episodes from this season. Thanks again for listening and see you in 2022. Peace. In the moment, you just keep saying yes to Jesus. When God invites you to something, or nudges you, or ambushes you, mm-hmm. it really doesn't matter. I don't, people say, well, you know, tell me about the call of God on your life. I said, I've felt <laughs> ambushed my entire life. <laughs> That's right. And, but you, we've just kept saying yes, and somehow, here we are, 46 years later, still in love with Jesus, still wanting to serve the body of And Christ. you still like each other. And we're deeply in love. We have yeah. two kids, six grandkids, two great grandchildren. That's right. And sons and daughters in the faith, sort of around the globe. There's no roadmap. There's no like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I, I, I don't know. We're just going to keep following it. Jesus. And now we're in a transition where it's like, we didn't get ourselves into this. So we're not, you yeah. know, it's not as though we've got this master plan for the next thing. Just... We're, we're going to say yes to the next thing. Welcome to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guests are Phil and Jan Strout, National Directors for Vineyard USA. All right, what up, friends? I'm in Maine. I'm in the woods. Here with the Strouts, I can see their barn. Slow rhythm meadows in the background. What's up, Phil and Jan? Hey, Adam. Welcome to Maine. So good to be here. Jan, you want to say hello? Great to have everyone here tonight at Slow Rhythm Meadows. Man, I'm happy to be here. I know that for sure. And I'm I'm so happy to finally have you all on the podcast. This feels tremendously overdue. Yeah, well, you talked about it a while back, but I had quite a rough year. Yeah. So you were kind to just sort of hold off until we had a little bit of our legs back underneath us. Yeah, and I just want to say, Phil, you look strong, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. You feel good? Younger than ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. I know that I pulled up and it looked like you got the yard mode. Yes, sir. So I all know you eight, must be feeling good. All eight acres of it. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Just for people who are listening to the podcast, this is not a small yard. No. Jan, do you ever mow the grass? I, When I was 60 years old, I learned how to use a lawnmower. But I don't use the one for the big lawns. I use the little one. But I had never mowed a lawn in my life. But at 60, I learned how to do it. Oh, too good. And I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. Okay. That's too good. Well, hey, here's what I want to start. I, I know that I've heard you guys talk about this a little bit. But I'm not sure that everybody in the vineyard knows this. And I just, I would love it if you guys would just tell this story because I think it's great. Will, will you guys talk about when you two met? And when you got married, will you just share some of that? that? I think that would be really cool. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Janet had pursued me for years. <laughs> it just years. Uh, I, I, as I heard a guy in Alabama once say. Jan's making faces. Yeah, Jan's making faces. <laughs> Jan's rolling her eyes. Yes. She always says, you have your version, I have mine. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I was, uh, as a guy from Alabama once said, I was as lost as a ball in tall weeds. That's right. I had no idea about God, uh, life, anything. And somehow we found our way. And Yeah, I was in a small town here in Maine, and it was during the 70s, and we were just uh, meeting God in a very powerful way. And, and our leader, who happened to be the pastor's wife, um, was really encouraging us all to pray for people by name, people that needed Jesus. <laughs> so Phil was on my prayer book as someone that needed Jesus. So that was some of our early introductions. Yeah, was and, that, and how was, old were you? Talk to me. Well, I was like 17. Phil was maybe 15 at the time. But, <laughs> yeah, but as we 16. were praying, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. she had a, there was a, a incredible elder statesman of the faith. I yes. didn't even know what that meant at yeah. the, at the, in the day. That came to the little town in Maine and preached on a Sunday night. And after he got done preaching, they invited him to come back on a Monday night and meet with the teenagers in the church. So that night, he told all the teenagers in the little community church, go to the high school and invite the most messed up kids in the high school to this meeting. <laughs> 
And I got seven invitations the next day <laughs> to that meeting. And uh, I had never been to a Christian meeting. Oh, so like you had no uh, Oh, no, no. I, I, was lo- I, I was like. You were serious. No, the, the weeds were tall. No orientation towards God, about God. I, I wasn't anti. I just I had no idea. Well, Jen, who was the president of the student council, prettiest girl in the high school, she comes up to me and she'd never said hi to me, I don't think, after all those years. <laughs> And uh, she says, I want to invite you to this meeting tonight. And, and I thought, wow, is she hitting on me? That's you right. Know, I thought it was kind of nice. So I agreed to go, of course. I went. I had no idea. I went out and got in a state of mind that we did back in those days. And, and w- I went to. <laughs> it's the 70s. <laughs> I, went, guys. I went to that meeting and I was, I was stunned, fascinated. And there was this elderly man at the time now he's i am now the age that he was at that time but he had spent many years in southeast asia as a preacher and missionary and uh, you know just i'd never been around somebody like him so when they opened the meeting he said let's pray i'd never been in a meeting where somebody opened with prayer he says and so he he was he was sitting on the floor there's about 45 teenagers in the room i knew i knew most of them and when he prayed he goes Oh, sweet Jesus. And it stunned me. And I felt bad for him because I, I realized he really believed somebody was listening. And that was, he shared, uh, they sang. I'd never been, you know, the acoustic guitar, they were, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and then he, he shared a little bit about Jesus. I'd never heard it. Yeah. And then a guy from Brazil shared his story, how he was, uh, he had been an alcoholic. He had been part of the communist movement, a country of Brazil. And then he, then he used the phrase, then I found Jesus. I met Jesus. And I had, that was like, what is he talking about? So they went on and they, they gave an invitation. I didn't know what an invitation was. And they said, if you want to know God, raise your hand. So I did. Cause I was like, well, yeah. Then they said, well, if you want to receive Jesus, come out in the kitchen. And I said, nah, that's foolish now. So they ended the meeting a little frustrated because I didn't go out in the kitchen. And Janet was sitting beside me, and she looked at me. She goes, well, what do you think? And I go, oh, and I just made up three or four, like, <laughs> dumb comments. Yeah. Because I wanted to play it cool because, you know, sure. she's drop-dead gorgeous. So I was just playing it cool. And every question, every argument I had, she had a 40-pound Thompson chain reference Bible, and she would open it and show me a, a, a verse. And I finally thought, man, I said, did that chick write that book? How did, she, how does she know that stuff? And uh, that was uh, so. So that, Jan, you had like superpower. You were like, you were ready. <laughs> well, we were we were really experiencing quite a a move of God in that small town, and I was just as shocked as Phil was that he showed up that night. Because when I w- was in high school they, that day and asked them to come, there was Phil and a couple other guys. Honestly, oh, I only knew that you invited me. I didn't know there were uh, other guys. No. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I really, I was just as surprised as Phil was that he showed up that night. Uh, but um, it was amazing. And then when everyone was breaking for the, the Kool-Aid and cookies, I struck up a conversation with Phil. I could tell he was really intrigued and wanted to know more. So we just talked and talked. And, and at one point in the meeting, a couple of the other friends that came to the same meeting with him, said, um, hey, Strout, we're getting out of here. And um, Phil stood up to leave. And I looked at him, and honestly, I don't even know where this came from. I looked at him right in the eyes, and I said, you don't want to leave. And he said, you're right, I don't. He sat back down, and the boys laughed going out the door, and they said, Strout's getting religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's been telling me what to do ever since. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a fascinating moment. Yeah, that that it wasn't uh, choreographed, but that night I did meet Jesus, and after um, I had be I prayed a prayer. Yeah, and the old sweet Jesus guy, the old missionary, about ten minutes after I had received Christ, he asked me if I wanted to go to Brazil with him that summer. What I had been a believer for ten minutes. He yes. asked me, he says, would you like to go to Brazil with me this summer and share with the young people there what just happened to you? And I said to him, what happened to me? He said, your sins were forgiven. You've got a brand new life in front of you. 
Adam, I can't even explain the depth of my understanding in that moment. I had like a crash course in understanding life, the love of God, the yeah. call of God, yeah. um, creation, my purpose in life. <laughs> I was 16 years old. Yeah. And by the time I got home that night, this was February 11th, 1974, freezing cold in Maine. And uh, I walked home, I walked Chan home, and um, I, I was like, oh, this was my life. My life is, is, I have been created to serve God. And it was like download after download after download. So did you go with that guy this summer? I did. I did. Jan, did you go? I did too. Yeah. Oh, man. I was 17. She was 18 and 19. Yeah. And and th that's how we got started in this. We got started as kids. I She was on her way to Baylor University. I oh, Texas. Another, yeah. And you I had a Baptist. Another... Well, actually, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're going to Baylor, you're but, but a Baptist. That, but that had nothing to do with the Baylor connection. My older, okay. my older sister had gone there okay. and I had visited her and loved the school. And I, that Amazing. Was, yeah. So we, <laughs> we went to Brazil that summer and then we came home. I had to finish high school, but in that year, we were clearly uh, in love. Yeah. And I'm not one to wait around for things to all work out. Let's just, why don't we just get married? And my, I asked my, I told my father, I had met the girl I wanted to marry. He said, well, we're good. you know, you still got university to go. You know, we're not, we can't do that right now. And I said, well, I'm not waiting for another four, five, six years. And he said, well, you, you, we really should wait till you get out of high school. And I said, okay. So Jen, I graduated on the 11th of June and the 14th of June, we got married three days later. <laughs> And I seven days later, we headed off to Brazil for our second time in Brazil and went to work with Life Ministries. And how long did you all stay in Brazil? We were in and out of Brazil, 74, 75, 76. But we were based in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. in western Pennsylvania, and we, it was short-term trips going in and out during Got it. evangelism. It, it yeah. formed our—this guy, he, he helped form our life with a heart towards the nations— and the, the the greatness of the people groups of the world became a reality. So we were just a couple of kids from a little mill town in Maine. Yeah. And uh, that's how we got started in this. Well, and we always say that we we grew up together. That was 46 years ago. And this is all we've ever done. Well, I've heard you guys talk about like some of this stuff before and like Brazil and then later Chile. So yeah. I know you guys have – you this early part of your ministry is very – South American in particular, yeah. right? And it's yeah. international. But, and I've heard you talk about this gentleman a couple yes. times. I would love for you to just tell us, what, do you, what did you pick up from him? What, what do you think that like God deposited through him to you that, that has like, been with you f for the rest of the year ministry? Well, it's so interesting when you think of, of the mentors that God puts in your life because you don't choose them. They come to you. God sends them to you. And in this case, one of the big picture pieces that Brother Earl, we affectionately called him Brother uh -huh. Earl, was, his name was Earl Tigert, was the Father's heart for the nations. Mm -hmm. And in our case, it was like God wanted us to really have the nations in our heart. And in our case, because Brother Earl had a, uh, a desire to go to Brazil, and at that time in the 70s, the same things were happening with the young people in Brazil as were happening with the young people in America. There was the drug culture, the free sex, the uh, Brazilian young people were very influenced by what was happening in America. And so in the same way that the American young people were experiencing the Jesus people movement or the, yeah. the that, that move in the 70s, that many times when we would go down into the streets of Brazil, there'd be flags saying the Jesus people are coming. And so we would do big festivals in the towns and, and, and that people type. would come. People came oh, yeah. by the hundreds. Yes. It was he, amazing. He, yeah. One of the things is I've never been with anybody that's led more people to Christ than this man. He and he believed in power evangelism. He didn't use that language. Yeah. But um, he just did it. He yeah. did it. He showed us. He was always, he helped people understand that they really did believe in God. Yeah. And he was, he, it was just uncanny. So he, he, we had a year with him with life ministries where we lived at the headquarters and we traveled back and forth to South America. And he gave us uh, 
a love for the word of God. He, he was, uh, he lived a life of faith. I stole my first prayer from him because he had prayed a prayer most of his adult life. Make my life a demonstration that you hear and answer prayer. Yeah. And that's where I learned that if you want to, if you want to be in a place where you, where you see miracles, you've got to be in the place where you need miracles. Yeah. And he taught us to not be afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, you know, he just gave us a, a great love. He talked a lot about, he actually sowed the seeds what developed later in life that we, that we call soul care. Yeah. But he gave us an understanding that, that ministry is overflow, not overwork. And he, he just, he talked about that all the time. Ministries overflow. That's interesting, Phil, because, and I'm going to, I'm going to say something here that's a little stereotypical, but it seems like maybe he was a little ahead of his time, right? Like, because at least oh, in yeah. my mind, in my mind, if you're, if you're thinking of Jesus people or someone who's kind of like working in that Jesus people movement, you, you know, we're talking about like people who are like, they're floating with the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're wherever the wind blows. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people who are power evangelism people or people who are all about winning people to Christ, a lot of times they don't have that contemplative soul care side, Yeah, right? Like they, 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 they learn it after they hit the wall, Yeah, hopefully. Well, so that, was, that's interesting. It was so funny when we met the vineyard and, and the kingdom of God teaching and the kind of, as um, uh, Jackson Bill says, Jackson? Bill Jackson yeah. says, you know, that in his book, The Quest for the Radical Middle, Brother Earl always used to say, this was back in the 70s, 80s, w when we were with him, I'm not charismatic enough for the charismatics, and I'm not conservative enough for the fundamentals. He was, he was always describing yeah, this place middle. that he was, he was in this radical middle and, and was teaching us about the radical middle, and he was always talking about the kingdom of God. And so it was almost like in those ways that the Lord prepares you for things. Like we were just prepared for Vineyard. We were yeah. just, Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. See, it, it, there's a thing here, Adam, that this is a good opportunity to say it. Mentoring's not about having 30 years with somebody necessarily, or even 20 or 10 or 5. It's the impact that even you might get a year with somebody. Mm. You just suck that for all it is worth. Yeah. And we, we, for, for a year... We, we met him in his office um, uh, for two hours, and he took us through the New Testament. Now, he did his devotions in Greek. I mean, this is a, well, you know, he had done his graduate work at Princeton. He had uh, been trained under a guy named Ellie Maxwell. So he was just an unusual guy. But we really, if you really add up the time, we had about a year with him. But it was like three years of seminary, five years of college. Yeah. And it was a gift. We, and we, we just happened to catch that wave. And we've had a couple of those in our lives, and it's made a it made a big difference. But yeah. he sewed that into us. I love that. Okay, so I know you did Brazil, and then I know you did Chile. H how did you get to Chile? Well, we had moved. Uh, fast forward to about the year eighty three or something like that. We had moved to, to Brazil. We were actually living there, planning a church, and the government changed, so they threw us out. Oh, and Brazil. Uh, from Brazil, we had to wait to get visas, and there was no way I wanted to be back in the United States. I, so. A friend of mine and uh, a friend of mine, we, we bought, uh, people won't even know this airline, we bought a seven-week ticket with Eastern Airline that you could fly <laughs> anywhere for seven weeks. Yeah. And we went all over South America. Yeah. And we, we started in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and we were there, and we were on our way to Buenos Aires. They wouldn't let us get on the plane because that was the time of the Falkland Island crisis between Argentina and, and uh, uh, England. So I said, well, where else does the plane go? And they said, well, it's going to stop in Santiago, Chile. And I said, okay, I'll get off in Santiago. And Jan, were you on this plane with me? I was not. I was okay. home praying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're like, what are we doing? What are, where are we going? What is that? And we met the right people. We, we got there. I didn't know anybody. The so one you just stepped out in Santiago. This is, by the way, if you haven't been there, this is a big city. It's a big city. Yeah. yeah. Well, five million people. Yeah. And we just landed there. And I, I had been, of course. It was with one other friend. More were learning um, Portuguese, of course, in Brazil. So then I, in the Spanish context, and I said, well, I'll, I'll go find the Anglicans because I know somebody will speak English. And so I, we made our way to the center of the city. We met this guy, uh, Alf Cooper. And this is where, and this is the beginning of the vine Vineyard Connection. Yeah. This is on. 1980. 
four, something like that. Yeah. And and he he basically said, I don't really have time to talk to you, but there's an American here buying some books. He'll he'll chat with you. He's, so the and the American was Roger Cunningham. Oh, amazing. Three months or four months later, Jan and I moved our family to Chile to plant a church. And we just figured we'll plant a church. And then when Brazil opens back up, we'll go back to Brazil. And we didn't leave the country for the next six years. We just stayed there for six years, planted a church, and and that's sort of how it got started. And, and was that the, the church in Los Condes? No, that was the church. It actually, we started it in the center. That church yeah. planted out of it. That's yeah, been, yeah, yeah. That's been all, all the those connecting points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So were you guys working with Roger? We or you just met him and we he kind of helped him, you orient. And he helped us get in the country. He introduced us to people. Yeah. Then we later we ended up working together. Yeah. And then we ended up in the vineyard together. Yeah. And while we were while we lived in Santiago, Roger and I actually together, we went to the Southern Islands and um he had he some uh, this guy Alf Cooper, the Anglican, had given us a couple of cassette tapes. We were in the Southern Islands. Trans, we, we were with a team of doctors and nurses doing medical clinics and meetings. And the uh, guy had given us some tapes. And they were by a guy named John Wimber. I'd never heard of Wimber, never heard of the vineyard or anything like it. The first tape I listened to was fascinating. And the, about 20 seconds into it, the Lord said, by the way, this is your tribe. And that was my introduction to... And what was the tape? It was on relationships and why you love the whole body of Christ. And there was not a sectarian... A thought in it it was embracing all the goodness of god's uh church and uh we just we just ate it up so a couple of weeks later when i got back to santiago i called my brother-in-law who lived here in the united states and i asked him to if he could investigate a group called the vineyard and he goes well you're not going to believe this but we just started going to a vineyard church amazing and i said really i said well send me a couple of tapes and about a month later he sent me a suitcase of vineyard tapes and this is probably now 86 87 something like that and it, and i i called him back i said dude i want a couple of tapes this is brainwashing yeah that's you right <laughs> yeah so it was all the classic uh wimber stuff so so you did you and jane just like listen to the tapes over and over <laughs> and over i love it and, i love it and the holy spirit would come it gave us language we started praying for the sick. And, you know, the Lord said at one point I'd landed, I was in an airplane, I landed in Santiago, and the Lord said something like, I just felt, you know, nudge. And it was like, uh, you're, you're going to start seeing healings. And I said, well, I'm more of a Bible teacher, God. And we started seeing, we started, that that was the introduction. And you've heard you've heard it many times. Once you've, once you've done it, you're hooked. Yeah, and we we were just hooked. It took us a few years to actually meet up with the vineyard. Yeah, but that's how you we were doing started. vineyard stuff. Yeah, we we were we were listening to all the in those days they were cassette tapes. And by the way, as we've traveled internationally, it's so funny. I'll go into a pastor's office in a vineyard. Say this happened literally in um, Australia. Australia. I'm like. You have the exact same collection of cassette tapes and folders that we had. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, there was something that was happening. Yeah, it was just stirring. But if Phil was talking about he was landing in Santiago and the Lord said, you're going to see healings, you're going to see miracles. And, and Phil's like, I'm a Bible teacher, but we did see incredible healings and miracles. And the other thing was we were asking the Lord to teach us how to worship. Yeah. Because we felt like we had a desire for more in worship. We had a longing and we sort of intuitively knew that we needed to learn and grow in worship. And then suddenly this vineyard worship was coming in and we were just weeping and like so yeah. thrilled with what God was doing. And there we were on the, you know, the ends of the earth down in the southern cone of South America. Yeah. And we were getting just so renewed and just... It's like, it's like you hear all over the world. Uh, you just discover this is who you are. Yeah. And you didn't try to do it. You didn't change to become it. It's like, no, this is the DNA. Yeah. And it gave us language. We had desire and we had, we just, we just didn't have the language. And we had run into the gospel of the kingdom about probably a year or two ahead of this. So the whole teaching on the kingdom from lad's perspective was 
already forming in us. And then we heard Wimber. He's a practitioner. Brought it to yeah, a he, he practice. Put, yeah, he put it in, into practice. And it was it was stunning to us. And uh, so it was a paradigm that we can we can do this. That we this, we can buy into this. Okay, so when did you guys come to a vineyard meeting in the United States or something? Talk to me about that. Uh, well, we I came up in '89. It was like I think one of the first conferences that um, Paul Kane was at. Yeah, Bickle and those. You know, it was just power, power, worship. You know, holy and anointed one, and all the things. Uh, you know, Barnett, and it was you know with Eddie Espinosa and others. It was just it was it was stunning to us. And then we came back here. The end of we moved back to the United States in '90. And just sort of tried to, you know, become a part of the vineyard. And I got sort of the, not a roadblock, but, hey, we're going to date for a couple of years. And, you know, you can, we'll check each other out. And I'm like, hey, guys, you put your tapes all over the world. There's people I've that, listened to a suitcase. There, 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 there's the people out suitcase. there who are vineyard. Yeah. And now you can't say, oh, we're not sure you're part of the fam- family. I said, yeah, you, can't, right. you guys can't do this. So I, yeah. You know, I, I sort of like pushed a little bit and. Got myself invited to a pastor's conference, and uh, this was like 91. Right, Denver. And I said, can my Chile friends come, who were then pastoring the church, you know, the, the churches that had started. So they let us go, and they set up a luncheon for Jan and I and three, I think, three or four Chilean pastors. And with Wimber, John and Carol, Bob and Penny, and just a little lunch off the big room. Amazing. And they sort of, the Chileans were unimpressed. They were just being, they're lovable, crazy folks. And, and <laughs> they didn't Bob, know they were being interviewed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. F- Fulton had told me very clearly, this is going to take a couple of year process and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So we had lunch with them. And they were leaving the lunchroom. Fulton said, Why don't, we're going to ask you to share for 20 minutes this afternoon. And I said, oh, right. you at don't the, even know who I am. What? At the main session. He says, tell us your philosophy of missions. Just share, share it. I mean, out of the... So I ended up in, what, a, in a main session. And he doesn't know you? No. And, That's a and, risky thing, Well, he it? says, he goes, well, sometimes we do this. <laughs> okay. So so I did. I got up. Th- th- they invited me up. I, I shared. And then we went back to our hotel. I get a call from Fulton about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, okay, we've made a decision. We're going to pray over you guys tonight. You're going to be a part of the vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, well, what happened to the two-year romance? He goes, well, sometimes we do this. That's right. And that is exactly how that happened. Amazing. And at So were you guys living in Maine? Ago. We, we were just come to Maine. Maine. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, you're in the vineyard. Now plant one? Well, we, was that there, was kind of a the small, thing? there was a small vineyard church here, which yeah. is now the Pathway Vineyard. Yeah. And so we, we st- started there, and then we moved to Portland to plant the Portland Vineyard, and then All the on things. and on and on. Yeah, that so was 30 when- years ago. So when we moved back from Chile, we were here in Maine, and we were helping with the first church vineyard plant in Lewiston. But in the meantime, we wanted our Chile churches to be part of the vineyard. So that's that was the Denver piece. Was yeah. And the, when Phil shared that afternoon his philosophy of missions at the Denver conference, it was the same afternoon that Luke Huber the, with the PAS, the the Brazilian Amazon mission, he. He shared. But the, the guys from the East Coast, when Phil said, I guess I'm speaking this afternoon, and they were like, what? You mean part of the vineyard. <laughs> what yeah. do you mean? What yeah, do you mean? Right. We invited you to this meeting. What's happening? Yeah, we've been, in, we've been in the vineyard for a decade, and we don't get to speak, Phil. So it was one of those crazy moments. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so you start, when you're in high school, you're just, you guys fall in love. You go to, to Brazil. You go to the Amazon or whatever it is, and then you go to Chile. Then you come back. But but now we're sitting in your living room here in Maine, mm-hmm. and you lead the vineyard in the United States. Kind of like, crazy, is how it? does this happen? Well, Phil and Jan, how does this happen? Well, the night that they asked us to do this, you know, a decade ago, we went back to our hotel and we were laying in bed at like one or two in the morning, laughing like two teenagers, saying the vineyard is this desperate <laughs> that they have asked yeah. two yeah, you two folks from Maine to lead this thing well as my as my spiritual father ray hollenbach says jesus has tremendously low standards (laughs) (laughs) exactly right yeah you you know you know (laughs) honestly adam you just you keep saying yes to god we we never set out to do anything we we just kept walking with jesus learning about you staying in love with jesus do his bidding and 
it, it, nothing was choreographed. Now, in the in the in in all of that story, of course, we went, we did our studies, and got an education, and 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 all of that. But and you listened you, to the suitcase of Wimber tapes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, it's not as though you say because someday I want to do this. Yeah, that's right. You what don't get it to is, choose. is in the moment. You just keep saying yes to Jesus. Yeah. And when 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 God invites you to something or nudges you or ambushes you, mm -hmm. really doesn't matter. I don't, people say, well, you know, tell me about the call of God on your life. I said, I've felt <laughs> ambushed my entire life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, but you, we've just kept saying yes. And somehow, here we are, 46 years later, still in love with Jesus, still wanting to serve the body of And Christ. you still like each other. And we're deeply in love. We have yeah. two kids, six grandkids, two great grandchildren. That's right. And, and, and sons and daughters in the faith, sort of around the globe. That's right. There's no roadmap. There's no like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I, I, I don't know. We're just going to keep following Jesus. And now we're in a transition where it's like people, I think for some reason, some people are more nervous about this transition for us than, than we are. Yeah. Because we didn't get ourselves into this. So we're not, yeah. you know, it's not as though we've got this master plan for the next no, thing. Just, we're we're going to say yes to the next thing. That's right. You just keep saying yes. Yeah. Well, okay. This is, this is a little circumspect, okay? Because... You have done all these things in the vineyard. God, you have kept on saying yes, and God's taken you around the world, and you've led the vineyard here in the U.S. for like 10 years now, and like your time of leading the vineyard is coming to a close. I would love for both of you to tell me what you think, just in your own words, what, what's the story of the vineyard? Sometimes I like to ask the question like that, you know? Like, what, what do you think the story of the vineyard is? And, and not even... I mean, maybe that's looking back, maybe it's looking ahead, however you want to frame it. But I would love to hear you just riff a little bit. Well, I always love the, the story, the early stories I heard about the vineyard of Bob and Penny and John and Carol and the folks that were in the room with them when they were Christians that knew the Bible, knew hymns, knew church structures and all of that, but they were desperate. Mm. for something that they knew they were missing and they cried out together and um and and the, that's kind of when the the real kind of what I call the vintage kinships happened when they would gather together and someone would express a problem and they'd say okay nobody counsel them nobody give them a verse let's invite Jesus to come and yeah. Jesus would come and so those early days of desperate, like, we know the verses, but where's the intimacy? Where's the presence of God? Mm. And then later saying, when then we found out the presence was the power. Yeah. And um, when I, so when I think about what is the vineyard, I think about that group of people in those days that cried out, and the continuation of it is the constant crying out in desperation of... God, we come Holy Spirit, yeah. that we don't meet as vineyard people without saying, come Holy Spirit, because we don't have the answers. Yeah, we yeah. can't give you the verse, lots of verses, but if you don't come, yeah. then, I mean, to me, that's the vineyard. See, for me, yeah, if, for me, the, uh, the story is nobody made up the vineyard. Nobody thought this up. This mm. is something the Lord did yeah. with that group of folks in Southern California. We had somebody like John Wimber, who was a catalytic person, very sure. apostolic, and Bob and Penny and Carol and others. And we had that for about 20 years. And then we've gone a good 20-some years without John. And now we're looking, saying, where's the next 20 years? So my story with the vineyard is, there's no superstars. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, you're invited to it. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think, honestly, one of the things, Adam, is... I think some of our critics thought that when John Wimber was done, the vineyard was done yeah. because they thought we bought into a personality. Mm. They thought we bought into this cool hipster, SoCal, chill reality. We bought into a, a theology of the kingdom that really stressed an intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, so, done by regular people. Regular right, people. Right, right. That's and right. And we have... And, and, and we haven't had somebody like John Wimber. 
And people are like, well, you know, you need somebody like John Wimber. It's like, really? J John Wimber's been multiplied tens of thousands of times around the globe yeah. in nook and crannies, in countries, right. in cities, in rural areas, in the mountains of the Andes, in the Himalayas. <laughs> yeah. It's and true. No, you, that's not a personality. No. Yeah. This, is, this has been something. The story of the vineyard was God thought this up, just like God worked with so many other groups. And I, I love that. I love it that we had a guy like John Wimber. Yeah. I'm deeply appreciative. We've had this last 20-some years without John, and we're carrying on. And this is part of the transition and the crossroads is really, okay, we had 20. That's 20. What about the next 20? Yeah. And we, we, we felt invited a couple of years ago to really say, okay, Lord, here's the intersection. Here's the crossroads. And we're going to stop and we're going to ask you about this. And the end result is a lot of the change and the, re the reimagining yeah. that's going on right now. And we're, we're a long ways into it now. Would you guys just talk to us about the crossroads? Because I've been in executive team meetings with you, both of you, about the crossroads. I think I was I was there when you kind of like slid this across the table to us. You know, <laughs> I've been in executive team meetings. I've been in in LTMs, leadership team meetings, and you have written a bunch of emails to vineyard pastors. But but there, there's probably still some vineyard pastors who haven't heard even even just like kind of the way this all began to change in the vineyard, this new transition. So Phil or Jan, like talk to Jan, talk to me about the crossroads. What happened? Well, I'll, I'll Cause start. we're in this moment. Uh, this uh, this uh, interesting start, moment. Uh, jump in, Jan. It, it, was, it was really something that probably 218, 219. Yeah. I started using the word crossroads or intersection in my journal. And I really felt it was a nudge from the Holy Spirit, but I sort of thought it might've been about Jan and I. Yeah. And so I just sort of, I didn't go public. I didn't preach on it. I didn't say anything to anybody. But it just shows up a lot in my journal. Like your prayer journal. Just my prayer journal. Just my day-to-day yeah. -day waiting on the Lord, you know, reading and thinking and writing it out. Because I, I am a, a journaler and Jan's a, like, gold star journaler. <laughs> uh, and, and Dan Will actually, he was preaching and he, he knew nothing about it. And he threw up Jeremiah 6.16 on the screen on a PowerPoint. Yeah. And it had nothing to do with the sermon. He goes, I don't even know why I'm going to put this up. I'm going to put it up. I'm going to yeah. leave it. And he said, then we're going to move on. He was teaching out of the book of Acts. And I was stunned when I saw it because the Lord said, "That's this is what I'm talking about. And what does Jeremiah 6.16 say? Well, it says, stop, look, ask the Lord. And it says, stop in the intersection mm. and ask the Lord. And uh, I was like, okay. And he'll invite us. He'll tell us, buy into it. And if you do, if you do what I say, it'll bring renewal to your life. And Israel turned him down. And I said, we're not going to turn you down. Yeah, so you felt, when, you, when, you, when Dan put that up there, you felt like, oh, this is the intersection. This is the crossroads I've been writing about. And this is not just about me Absolutely. or Jan. This is about the vineyard. I, don't, I did not hear another word that Dan Welch said that day. Okay. Because the Holy Spirit just, just said, I'm in... This is the way on for the vineyard. This is the future. But I didn't know what it was. And I didn't pretend that I knew what it was. Yeah. All I knew is that, and that's when I started to leak 
Yeah. Jeremiah 6.16. Yeah. And first with some of the staff and then with some, some uh, executive team members. And then as it started to gain momentum, I was getting some real affirmation from, from people and the word and, yeah. and, and, and prophetic words. And it, it really was a time where had we carried on, some people wouldn't have even, okay, everything's cool. But in my mind, had we just carried on, even if we had, you know, finished out our time and get the, another leader, yeah. go on, you know, and, and most people would say, okay, we're good, we're good. But I would have known in my spirit that we missed an invitation mm. to, to get what we needed for the future. And I, I honestly am, I'm thrilled because if you remember, what we did was we invited people to a 40-day fast. Yeah, I remember. And then we said, Lord, we know if there is an intersection, if it, if it is not saturated and bathed with your spirit, it's just we're not looking for a new strategy, yeah. a new image, a new brand. What do you want? And our DNA, our calling card in the vineyard is if the Holy Spirit doesn't do it, we're not good. We don't do it. Other people might be able to pull it off, but the vineyard's not going to pull it off without the presence of the Spirit. And we did the conference on Come Holy Spirit. That's right. And I think Dayton, Denver were testimonies that the Lord came. Yes. And I think the executive team and uh, literally thousands of people joined us with that mm -hmm. 40. A lot of people didn't pass, pass the full 40 days, but we had 40 days of some people were fasting and praying and writing in prophetic words and sharing uh, impressions and nudges. Then we had that, the, uh, the conference, and then we started the process and yeah. to which... Uh, the end. The end result with that is Jay and Danielle yeah. being being asked to become the national directors, and then what they've been doing and with with the the rest of the team at uh, bringing on a lot more help and yeah. changing some of those things. Uh, and and as we as this started to unfold. What was fascinating was I really, this is what I felt. Now, I, I haven't talked a whole lot about it, but enough that I really knew if it was me and I was leading the movement into a whole new day, I would want to be involved in the formation of that instead of inheriting it. And I felt the Lord nudge Jan and I to actually step down a year early yeah, so that the person who was going to take our place, the person's, and the team, they could be involved at the very ground floor. So they could shape it. So they could shape it. You, did just, you didn't want to just hand them, like, no, hey, now you got to live with this. I just, that's, that's not leadership. Yeah. Our, our leadership was we, we embraced the future, and I sort of, we sort of knew that we would lead, we, we led into the intersection, but it was for someone else to lead the movement out of it. And we're, we're incredibly comfortable with that. Yeah. And uh, after all these, you know, four and a half decades of doing this, we know there's other stuff for us to do. And, yeah. you know, being a part of the vineyard and you don't have to sit in any seat at the vineyard to be a part of this. So, so what you're telling me is you're not leaving. No. <laughs> Jan, you want to say anything about that? No, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, good, yeah. good. Yeah. And, you know, it's true. We have served in the vineyard on practically every possible. I can't think of something we haven't done Yeah. in the vineyard, but no, we're not going anywhere. And, when we first were asked to step into the national director role, one of the things that we knew kind of intuitively was by the time that we were done, there would be, it would be a transition from first generation vineyard to second generation vineyard. And we didn't know exactly how that would transition and what it would look like. But it is pretty amazing when we think about how the Lord gave that uh, crossroads word that that crossroad place is that place of transition, yeah. of generational transition. And I'm just so thankful for how beautiful, how beautifully the movement has, has leaned into this transition and yeah. the great expectation really we have for future, for the future, for yeah. what's going to happen. I, 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 yeah, I feel that. I, I feel that I can, I can feel it from you guys, and I feel it from other people I talk to. You know, yeah. Um, well, let me let me let me ask you this: What do you guys think about Jay and Danielle? 
Let's put it on well, record. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to make a wise comment. I'd like <laughs> yeah, to make, yeah, yeah. Yes, just to leave everybody hanging. Yeah. I I honestly am so I'm so thrilled. Yes. Um you know, watching watching Jay and Danielle through the years and uh I I I honestly just they're the they're the they're the folks for this moment. Mm. And uh, we're we're big fans. We're going to cheer. We're going to serve. Uh, I think it's so good. You know, they've got they've got a, a good twenty plus years of experience, and and they're still so young. They can lead for a long time. Correct. And is there and, anyone that Jay doesn't know? That's no, what I want to know. No, that's what I'm saying. He knows the Pope. <laughs> We have I mean, you know the Pope. Well, so what are we talking about here? But like, Jay knows everyone. That's what yeah, I want to talk I, about. I always, what I like about Jay, one of the things I love about Jay is, he, and this is a little barnyard philosophy. It's not exactly theological. Correct. But Jay's the type of guy who's going to fall into a, a pile of manure and come out with a handful of roses. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that's just favor. Mm-hmm. And I think, honestly, uh, I, I just couldn't be more thrilled. Yeah. And... Uh, so yeah, that, we're, we're just we're walking this like thing. We've got a few months left, yeah, and we're, we're trying to stay out of the way, and yet you know we put our shoulder, lean into serving in a way that 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 helps. But I I think they're uh, and and the, and the team, you know, as this begins to now come out, the yeah. folks that are going to be the associate national directors and the super regional leaders and the the team that they're they're gonna they're putting together. Uh, yeah, A plus. I'm thrilled. I am too. I'm I'm really excited about just like that national team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a thing the Vineyard has never had, and it feels like we're getting it in a moment when we need it. Yeah, yeah. And another interesting quality not not quality, but something that's just true about Jay and Danielle is they grew up in the Vineyard. Correct. And you know, and every Bingo. everyone in generation one of vineyard we kind of all came into the vineyard from different formation different you know places Gullickson, you know Wimber, um hunter calvary chapel Wagner, pentecostal Charles. baptist but you know when you get to the pathics it's like and, and jay and vineyard. jay and danielle grew up in the vineyard and so it's not like they're wondering what the vineyard is they were formed by by the vineyard and so I just think it's so interesting going into second generation vineyard that we're going to be led right now by two vineyard people. <laughs> that's right. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's a really astute observation. Yeah. We're, we're, our movement has grown up to that point now, hasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. So I want to talk to you about one more thing. Um, I, I've been reflecting a little bit about like some of your all's contribution to the vineyard. Like what, what do I think the Strouts brought to the vineyard? And this is just my perspective, and you're free to disagree with it, but, and someone else can add in any, anything they want. But one of the things I feel like you guys have brought to the vineyard is this idea of soul care. I'm not saying that it wasn't in the vineyard before you guys were here. I'm sure there were right. practitioners, oh, yes, absolutely. right? absolutely. Like there were. Yes. But I will tell you, I didn't know about it. I didn't know about the contemplative life in the vineyard until you guys were yeah. Like putting this out. So can you talk to me about your contemplative journey or your your soul care, Ignatian spirituality? Because I think that's something you've put into the vineyard for our good. If there is a contribution that we've made and, yeah. and that is could be one of those those things, then I think it is. We'll be thr- we would be thrilled. Yeah. It really go- it really starts back with Brother Earl. Yeah. And ministries overflow, not overwork. Um, but we also, in the journey, one of my late life, later in life mentors, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Frederick, I met with him, I think from 1995 to the year 2010, I met with him for two hours for 15 years every month. And in 15 years, two hours every month, he never asked me about my church. He would answer questions if I'd ask him specifically in our in our time together, but he always asked me how my soul was. So this is like spiritual direction moment. Yeah, he yeah, would. This just, is something more. Exactly. He, I mean, this is a guy who went. He was at Wheaton with 
Jim Elliott and Elizabeth Elliott, Nate Saint, and those guys. And when they went off to Ecuador, Dr. Bob, he went out to Fuller and actually did his degree and his graduate work under George Eldon Lett. So he became a, a, a dear, dear friend of us. And, and a, like I say, I, I got sort of like a midlife mentor. And I asked him once, I says, Bob, I said, you never asked me about the church. And he said, oh, Phil, he says, you, you guys in the vineyard, you'll do fine. He says, but if you don't have a true inner life, you'll ruin whatever it is that you built. Mm. And, and it was like one of those moments, like I really heard him. I heard, because by then we had seen so many blow ups and people building stuff and then blowing it up from just, you know, they, they're, 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 Private life did not match their public life. That was one piece of it, and it was a big piece of it. Phil Hauser, and he and he, he loved Jenny. He always asked me, "How how's your wife? How's your family? And how are you on the inside?" And he would call me out on any anything, but it was always on the the true inner life. How's your soul? How's your soul? And I mean, you know, he was. I mean, he's like eighty four at the time. He's like, "Well, oh, you know, how's." How's your sex life? And I said, well, fine. How's yours? I mean, you know, I don't, <laughs> yeah, yeah. what are 84? How am I going to answer here? that? <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, he got, it, it was real stuff, real, real stuff. Yeah, he, he would dig in. How are you really in. doing? How are you, How really, are you really doing? doing? And, and about that time, this is maybe 20, 20 plus years ago, I actually, uh, I did a master's program and I basically ended up focusing on the religious orders through the first 15 centuries. And somehow I ran into what I've called one of my life mentors, and that was St. Ignatius. And that stuff, his, the, the Ignatian stuff so resonated, it was like I was born again, again, again. And it became a pathway. It became uh, the language and the practice. And the, the, even, even I, I'd go as far as to say with Francis Xavier, uh, uh, a, a missiology that I found in the Ignatian spirituality. And that, that uh, I was never worried. Charles Bella, one of our dear friends, I heard him once say, in the, he said, early on in the vineyard, we were taught how to encounter darkness out there, you know, with, you know, power evangelism and, 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 you know, casting out of demons. He said, we learned how to deal with darkness out there, but we never were taught how to deal with the darkness inside. And when I heard him say that, that feels like a word. It was a mm. stunning mm. moment. And yeah. I said, okay, if we, yeah. and, and the vineyard was on a trajectory towards that, because if you remember under Burt, uh, you know, the pastor's Sabbath retreat. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so there was, we were, we were, we were waking up. We were, were walking yeah. in that direction. And we had seen enough tragedy and enough blow ups that we knew we, you can't just do business as usual and, you know, press the activism button. Yeah. If, if guys and gals did not have a, tr uh, 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 an overflow of life. Yeah. So, yeah, no, we became, we're, we're, yeah, we bought in. We bought into that. And you know, what's what's on the inside is what you can really give. That's authentic. And I didn't try to put on John Wimber's armor. I didn't try to put on Bert's armor. I didn't try to put on uh, anybody else's armor. Yeah. Jan and I had some things that if we if we add it to the salad and it helps, good. And if that's one that I was hoping that it would get to the place where fruitful longevity would be the common reality in the life of our leaders, pastors in the vineyard. Not the exception, but that fruitful longevity, that we would have men and women who would be in this leadership thing for 20, 30, 40, 50 years without blowing it up. Well, I remember a few years ago, you shared a word. Is it some leadership meeting? I, I think maybe you two had been walking around the property right. and, and a, like a tree. Yes. The tree was blown over. You, you, you want to just like, that seems pertinent in this conversation. You want to just like share the, 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 the center of that? Sure. Because it, it feels, re it resonates with this moment. Well, there was three things, th three things. And it basically was. was um, how deep is the core? How deep are the roots? How yes. deep, how deep, how deep are, are the roots? roots? How developed is the core? And how deceiving is the scaffolding? That's right. And I, I, here on our property, I had three very natural experiences 
where I had big, beautiful, 100-year-old white pines were blown over in a simple windstorm and come to find out they had no roots. They'd grown up. The day before, they looked so the strong. The day before, it was the grandeur of white pine. Yeah. And it came over, and it took up like 20, what I always say, like 27 smaller trees right. ended up getting killed because this one tree didn't have roots. Oh, so you're saying that even the big tree fell on the, little the trees. Root, no, the, so the, and whole, they came up with it. The, oh, they were uprooted also. It uprooted everything. So the metaphor goes deep here, doesn't the it? The yeah. like, like, tree like, so had if, no if, roots. If, if, if I don't have roots, if, I don't, if, the, if the center of my person, if there's no core, I'm not just damaging myself when I blow over, it's right? It's collateral right. damage. Right. Yeah. That's and right. you know as well as I do, when somebody spins out, it collects a lot of other people. When someone spins out, it collects a lot of other people. So one was, you, what, are, what are you rooted in? What are you, what are you really rooted in? And then core. I had a small apple tree. I have several apple trees on my property, and I had a, a, a mature apple tree that I nudged with my tractor by accident, um, and it just snapped over. And when I went to look at it, I shut the tractor off. I got off the tractor. I looked at it, and the tree, which you know was a mature, probably a 25-year-old tree, had nothing it was veneer there was no core in it whatsoever it was rotten to the core but it was in full beautiful bloom yeah it looked perfect it, it looked, looked gorgeous. Like yeah, the, it day, gonna, the day before it was the, 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 the picture you would the take the moment before i hit it if you looked at that you would have said that was a healthy tree but when it got nudged it revealed it had nothing was left to the core and over it went and within a half hour i had it on my wood pile and it was gone <laughs> yeah and then the so that's Roots, core. core. What are you? Really, what's really at the center of who you are? Mm. And this is all about soul care. Yeah, it is. You know, rooted and grounded, good core. You know, you're not putting your finger up. Which way is the wind blowing? What do I really believe? What if everybody else changes their mind? Do I? Do I? Is is that really the core? And then we had a, a third tree. It was a, a, a small ash tree, and it grew up near, sort of woven in with a big white pine. And the white pine got knocked over in the same windstorm. And what it re- and this this ash tray uh, ash tray <laughs> this ash tree was probably forty five feet high in the air. So it was a it was a it's a big tree. It's a big tree. Okay. Yeah. And that was in the fall, so it had no leaves on it. The next spring, when the leaves came out, the tree and I have pictures of this. The tree bent right over and, t- and basically doubled over and fell because it had it, st- it was being actually held up by something else and it had no strength in itself. And so once the scaffolding was taken down, the tree crumbled. Yeah. It took a while. It took about six months. But when the tree bore its full weight of the leaves, you right. don't think that that's heavy, but right. in, in a, it, it, it is. Um, it bent right over, and, and the Lord said, here's three prophetic pictures I've given you. And you talk about this, you preach it, and you put it deep into your own life. How deep are the roots, how developed is the core, and how deceiving is the scaffolding. And a lot of folks, Adam, in, in ministry, the thing that, that we get, we, we really do get caught up in the bells and whistles and recognition and notoriety and all that stuff. It's all scaffolding. Yeah. And you can't, you, you, it's, it, you got to be careful of that. Well, when you, mm-hmm. when you preach that word, I heard it and I, I hear it even now. Yeah. It's a, that's a perennial word for us. I hope people come back to this little segment of the conversation and hope it goes into their, their hearts and minds because it is true. We know people who have blown up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, Jan, I have a question for you because uh, I've come to know you over the last few years. And one of the things I know about you is, I experience you as a prayer person. I experience you as like someone who, who, who carries like, like a word from God. I, I've been in lots of meetings with you where you just, like things are being said, but then Jan has a word, you know? And it, 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 it almost always feels like, oh, this is a word for God from us. I, I'd love to know, I'd love for you to just share, what's God saying to you right now? What, is, is there, are you carrying a word for us, with us, to us right now? What are you putting in your prayer journal? Mm. That's what I want to know. Well, I mean, as we speak, we're in such an incredible time of history around the whole globe. Just a, I mean, when when we talked about 
standing in the crossroads and waiting, we, we were talking about our own vineyard movement. We weren't imagining that the whole globe would be at such an uh, incredible moment with the pandemic and all of this. And, and um, so I think one of the things that resonates in my spirit, I keep hearing it over and over and over, is these are not days to walk by sight. Mm. Um, because we know what the promises of God are. We know what, we know what the end of the age is going to look like. I love Derek Morphew when he talks about the end of the age, and then he says, and then there's the end of the end of the age, and then there's the end of the end of the end of the age. And we're getting closer to that. I mean, we don't know times and dates, but we know, we know seasons. And so in these days, I, I think one of the things the Spirit is saying is don't walk by sight. Because God is moving. God is moving powerfully, even in the midst of what seems like somewhat of chaos or, yeah. or um, that it's not business as usual. We can't depend on the same scaffolding that we've, you know, with our even church systems or everything looks different. And one of the things in Matthew it says that the the harvest is the end of the age, and we're all anticipating a tremendous harvest of souls before Jesus comes. I mean, we know Jesus will come. That's our blessed hope. But we can't walk by sight. We can't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We trust in what God's doing. And so I, I, I think that. that's what I hear God saying is don't walk by sight. Just yeah. stay the course. Yeah. But that goes back to even some of the stuff Phil was sharing a moment ago, like, what are your roots, right? right? Yeah, I mean, like, don't walk by sight. That's that's another way of saying, like, what are you really rooted in? What's really at the center? What are you, who's leading you? Who, exactly. are, you, who are you giving your yes to? Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, it, it, it boils down to st stay the course. Uh, you know, the church has sometimes has, a, and maybe it's more contemporary, but just the, the habit of becoming cosmically bored. And we need, you know, new things, vogue, exciting, flashy, Wow. And where I believe let's, let's, we do what we, the church has done in its best moment. And that is share the gospel, mm. proclaim good news. And anyone that responds, disciple them. And out of all those that you disciple, look for the leaders that are going to carry on what you, what, what you've been doing and what people who led you were doing. And you include everybody. Yeah. So that's just, then you do it again. Amen. You're not looking for like the new show. Yeah. I, I, I do have, I've had, you know, guys that I've wa walked with through the years. Sometimes they'll call and say, Phil, what do you think the Lord's doing? As though God said, you know, I, I, they're bored down there. So I got to come up with a new gig. Yeah. It's like, do it again. Yeah. Let's get enough, you know, just do it again. Okay. Can I just reflect one thing through this conversation that we've had? Uh, one of the things is obvious to me. It seems important in your story as I've been listening to you is at key points, you guys have always had a mentor. Mm -hmm. Like yes. Earl, and mm -hmm. then at a certain level, like... Fulton. Fulton and John Wimber. And then not, later... Not Wimber so much, but Fulton. But those early Vineyard guys, yes. yeah. Yep. Like the Wimber tapes, I'm just thinking yep. of the suitcase yep. of yep. tapes. And then Bob Fulton. I have and, to say Mrs. Vincent, who was early on in my... as a, When I was a teenager, Mrs. Vincent. Yeah, so I, the, these seem this seems important, right? Like God has given you a, a mentor for every season. And then yeah. like even a moment ago, Phil, you were telling the story about how, kind of like later in life. You you had you had the gentleman, Doctor Bob, yeah, Doctor Bob, Bob, who's saying to you, "How's your soul?" That's yes. like God is God's leading you, but He's doing it with with mentors. Mm. Oh yeah, mm. that that seems important. It, yeah, and it, and it's still you got to have a, a hand up, a hand out, and a hand down. Bring somebody along on the journey. I've always looked for somebody 10, 15 years ahead of me, which is getting thinner and thinner as yeah. Jane and I are aging. But I still have a couple of, we have a couple of couples um, uh, around the globe that, that we actually, we Zoom with them probably once a month, minimally, maybe twice a month. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we still keep that. that. That feels like a word. I mean, yeah. I'm, 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 as I'm listening to your old story, that feels like a, it feels like a word to me. Yeah. Like I have, 
I've had mentors in my life. I have someone I'm, you know, a spiritual friend. I'll put it that way. And then, mm-hmm. but that seems like a pertinent word for all of us, right? Yep. Like, like yep. keep somebody in your life who's mm-hmm. a little further down the road. Yes. Sometimes I call them wisdom figures. Who are the wisdom figures in my life right now? And and Phil earlier mentioned Saint Ignatius. You know, sometimes there are people in our lives that invest that they're dead and gone. That's but right. their influence and their what they contribute is ends up forming us and shaping us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that. Uh, yeah, I, I cost from Lorraine Mitchell from Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah, you know, they're they're ones that we're on a Zoom, you know, as often as we can. Yeah, and you know, the big Greek sort of just <laughs> keeps it keeps it keeps it out in front of me, and yeah, and dear friend, I mean, just a dear friend, but. Also, I listen when when people yeah. like that talk. I listen. Oh, I love you know, that. Yeah. I love that. So, well, guys, what a conversation! And I, I just want to say, I'm I'm just so thankful for your leadership and your friendship and like who you are. I'm and I'm just talking about me now, right? Like who you've been to me. Like you guys have been so good to That's me. Really you've been so good to Heather and and my church. And I just want to say thank you. And you know, and who you are to the vineyard. I just want to say thank you for everything you've been doing for the vineyard and everything you'll keep doing for the vineyard. You know, I know you're not going anywhere. So I just want to say, thanks. It's a privilege. Can I, can we do one more thing before I press unrecord? Yeah. Uh, would each of you just, would you just pray for the vineyard? Would you do that for us? And we'll just, we'll just end there. Mm. Yeah. Oh God, we thank you for the vineyard that you watch over day and night and you have been so good and so faithful yeah. So we pray for the the spectacular horizon that's to come. We pray for a second generation vineyard that will carry on not only here in the United States but across the globe. And we we praise you for what you have done and what you will continue to do. Give give strength, give courage, give wisdom, give kindness yeah. for the days ahead. Mm. Amen. Well, we we do. We pray for the vineyard here in the U.S. and and global, the global vineyard. Father, for John and Eleanor, their their leadership and uh, all that you're doing for Jay and Danielle and the new team. <laughs> God bless them, strengthen them, let them in, let let them, Father, really know that you're going to back them up. So, yeah. thank you for these opportunities, God, and all you've done in all of our lives. And we say onward, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, everyone. Casey Corum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. As always, if you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. First of all, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also, connect with us on social media, Instagram at the Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace.